welcome back. So this is the second uh, half of chapter 21 in Michigan's money and banking textbook. So this explores specifically the connection between the IS curve and the MP curve, which we developed in earlier sections and how that relates to our notion of aggregate demand. So the beauty of this is that it allows us to put all of these pieces together to understand the basic uh, mechanics of how demand can change through shocks and policy. So as I mentioned, the, the IS and the MP curves are gonna be integral to our understanding of the aggregate demand curve. Um, and so the idea here is that when we put all these pieces together, we have on the household side, we have the firm side, we have government side, we have the net export side, we have all those spending by all those different sectors of the economy. It incorporates shocks in those various sectors of the economy as well. And of course, more importantly, it allows us to understand and explain in a basic way, fiscal and monetary policy. And so the idea here of the aggregate demand curve is gonna be such that once we put all these pieces together, ultimately it's gonna allow us to say something about this relationship between on the one hand, how prices, or more importantly, the way that we're gonna frame it, inflation changes, and how that translates to changes in the demand for goods and services by uh, household firms, government, and the net export sector in total or in aggregate. And so the, the intuition behind this, this mechanism, which we'll see here in a second, is such that when the inflation rate changes, as we saw in previous uh, lectures, that's gonna impact the Fed's automatic response to a uh, monetary policy instrument. And that's gonna impact the cost of borrowing, the real interest rate. That's gonna impact planned spending in uh, terms of consumption. If consumption is uh, sensitive to interest rates, firms plan investments, and also through the net export sector and that exchange rate mechanism that we talked about before. And so those channels then are gonna transmit through to changes in this goods market equilibrium level of output. And hence we have this connection between inflation and how that changes uh, the level of output uh, demanded at that level of inflation. And so you can see pretty clearly that there's gonna be this inverse relationship between inflation, as you would expect, and the aggregate amount of output demanded. Again, the mechanism works through the fact that when inflation, say, increases, the Fed is gonna automatically respond to that by increasing its policy rate, by increasing the real interest rate. That has impacts on changing households, firms, and the net exports plan spending in those um, arenas, and that translates through to changes in the aggregate amount of output demanded um, as a result. So that's the intuitive mechanism for how we think about um, how we think about these things working. So let me walk you through uh, a visual of how we can drive this relationship between these and, and, and how these all uh, fit together. So if we think about um, our MP curve, again, the analysis that I just walked you through said, well, suppose hypothetically we have a change in the inflation rate. And suppose in particular we have, say, an increase in the inflation rate to some arbitrary level, pi two. Well, at pi two, as I said, the Fed is gonna increase its interest rate policy instrument um, through this MP curve. So we just move straight up along that as a result of the change in the current inflation rate. As a result of the higher interest rate going from R1 to R2, well, that's gonna result in a movement along this IS curve. So with at that higher real interest rate R2, we simply move up along our given IS curve here. And so at that point R2, we have a new goods market equilibrium level of output demanded at this level Y2, okay? So you can pretty easily see the connection between what we just did here and how that translates through to our goods market equilibrium. What happened? Inflation went up from pi one to pi two. As a result of these mechanisms, the amount of output demanded, our goods market equilibrium level of output demanded in the economy declined from Y1 to Y2. So we have this inverse relationship between, uh, on the one hand, how the inflation rate behaves and how that works through these different mechanisms of planned spending to change the aggregate amount of output demanded. And so as we move up from A to B, you can see that that moves us along these various uh, curves here. And that's the way that we can construct uh, graphically or intuitively our notion of aggregate demand. Now, We've introduced this before, this uh, sort of ugly looking numerical representation. 
again, this puts all the pieces of the household spending, um, the firm's plan investment, the government sector, and the net export sector forces a goods market equilibrium. And then we saw for why as a function of all that other stuff. Okay. So this thing here, if you recall, is the equation for our IS curve. Uh, again, we have all of these autonomous components here. And then we have those other components, those parameters, which govern the slope of that IS curve. And if we put that together with our MP curve, okay, the way that we're gonna put that together, of course, is we substitute this equation into there, right? And so if we do that, it's pretty easy to see, you get something that looks like this. So you can see that there's, again, this autonomous component here, and then there's also the separate component, and I'm gonna be slightly messy and um, with my math here, um, but this is also just a constant, this little piece here. And then we also have this component here, which multiplies the inflation rate times that other uh, little component as well, okay? So that's the piece that governs, again, the slope of our aggregate demand curve. The important part of this, of course, is we have that minus sign there. So that means that as inflation goes up, aggregate output demand goes down and vice versa. And so that gives us this downward sloping relationship. So we can look at various um, shifts of our aggregate demand curve. Um, so first of all, there's, there's several sources of these shifts. Um, we can look at on the IS side, how the IS curve can actually impact the aggregate demand curve and lead to shifts. Um, so we talked about changes in autonomous spending through these pieces here. And so those are gonna result in shifts of the IS curve and hence also holding everything constant, the aggregate demand curve. Um, we looked at changes in fiscal policy here. Um, and so those two things also shift the IS curve and as we'll see, can shift the aggregate demand curve. And then this other piece of financial frictions right there. And as we saw again, those lead to shifts of the IS curve and will shift the aggregate demand curve as well. We can also look at changes in monetary policy. So these changes in monetary policy are not surprisingly designed to impact aggregate demand. So um, what we'll see later on is that policymakers can use the MP curve to try to drive and stabilize um, uh, the economy uh, in the face of, of shocks, unforeseen shocks. And that can be done through either an easing of policy or a tightening of policy. And then again, to keep in mind here, movements along the aggregate demand curve are just gonna be represented by changes in the current inflation rate. So as the inflation rate goes up, as we just learned hypothetically, that's gonna be a movement along our aggregate demand curve. That's how we derive the aggregate demand curve to begin with. So those changes in inflation don't shift the aggregate demand curve, you just move up and down along them. Let's look at some examples. Um, so here we have an example of a decline in autonomous Spending, in this case, we can assume a time autonomous consumption. This might be something like households think the economy is gonna be really lousy in the future. So they might decide to cut back on uh, autonomous consumption, their frivolous spending, if you will. And so the result, as we've um, seen in the past, is that's gonna end up resulting in a shift of our IS curve. And so holding interest rates constant, so if we're just looking at this sort of arbitrary interest rate, R1, at any given interest rate, output is the, gonna decline to Y2, okay? Now, what does that mean for our MP curve? It turns out that our MP curve is gonna be unaffected, okay? Again, we're assuming everything is held constant. So assuming interest rates are held constant and inflation is held constant, then what's gonna happen to output. Well, you just saw output's going to go down. So at this arbitrary level of inflation and at this arbitrary level of interest rates here, we just learned that output is going to decline given a chain, a decline in autonomous consumption or a decline in any other autonomous measure of, of spending. So as a result, our aggregate demand curve is also going to shift to the left. It's going to shift to the left horizontally by the same amount of the change in our IS curve. So at the end of the day, we're gonna end up with this, oops, with this change 
that's going to lead us to point B after this decline in autonomous consumption. Again, our MP curve is unaffected because we're holding everything else constant here. Um, so assuming interest rates and inflation are unchanged, then this is what's going to uh, result here. Now, once we introduce aggregate supply and introduce um, equilibrium in the economy, then inflation is going to adjust and, and there'll be some more complications involved in that. Um, but that's uh, a story for another day. Okay, so here's another example. So we looked at spending. So here's the financial frictions. Um, in this case, suppose that financial frictions decrease, right? So again, keep in mind that financial frictions really impact the cost of borrowing here, the real cost of borrowing. So with financial frictions decreasing, then holding our benchmark or risk-free rate constant, that means that the cost to firms to borrow, that is the cost that they face to borrow is going to go down. So even though we're holding this benchmark uh, safe interest rate or risk-free interest rate constant, the interest rate that firms face in order to borrow for capital equipment and those kinds of things is gonna decline. And so because of that, plan investment should go up. And in that sense, we would expect our IS curve to shift to the right. So at any given interest rate, again, this is our, our safe or uh, risk-free interest rate, so to speak, we would expect plan spending and hence total output to rise, okay? And again, holding inflation and interest rates constant in this case, that means that there's gonna be nothing happening here in this MP picture. The MP curve isn't gonna shift. We're not gonna move along the MP curve at all. It's just gonna sort of sit there. And of course, with our aggregate demand curve, again, we get this similar story with the rise in plan spending and the shift to the right of the IS curve, our aggregate demand curve also shifts to the right by the same amount. So we end up with a decline in these financial frictions at our new point B on both our IS curve, our aggregate demand curve, and of course the MP curve, which is by default the same, um, the same place. So again, we're sort of arbitrarily holding um, interest rates and inflation constant at this particular level to find out the impact on output. And that helps us understand how these shifts um, play out. So we look at another example. In this case, we're looking at monetary policy. So in this case, we have an autonomous easing of the MP curve. And so again, as I talked about, this could be because um, the, the Fed might be worried about the current, the, the future state of the economy. We could be going into a recession or something of the like. With an autonomous easing of monetary policy, if you recall, that means our R bar goes down. So the intercept the vertical intercept is going to shift down, which means this curve, our MP curve, shifts vertically down. And so we end up at a point like point B. And that, of course, means that our real interest rate declines. And so if our real interest rate declines, then again, that reduces the cost of borrowing. And so what that means is that with a lower cost of borrowing, that should increase plan spending by households, by firms, and through that net export uh, exchange rate channel to the point where plan spending and hence output demanded ended up going up. So at that new lower interest rate, output demanded rises. And the key to thinking about how that impacts aggregate demand again is if we're holding our inflation rate constant at some just arbitrary level, at any given inflation rate, what's gonna happen is output is gonna rise. So in this case, if we hold inflation constant at pi one, then as we've seen here, output is gonna go up from Y1 to Y2. So we end up at point B. And so this suggests that our aggregate demand curve shifts out to the right because of this autonomous easing of monetary policy. And of course we can do the opposite. If we have a tightening, then everything works exactly in reverse.
so this table summarizes um, the things that I talked about. I didn't go through all of these examples, um, but you can go through the examples yourself to uh, brush up on how the mechanics of these things operate and how each of the models, the IS, the MP, and the aggregate demand curve all work together to try to understand the impacts of shocks to spending and monetary policy and fiscal policy. Thank you.